Hey there team, let's not waste any time with the preamble, we got a lot of ground to cover. So let's just get right into it. Here we go with the most infamous expansion of World of Warcraft, the Battle for Azeroth. The Burning Legion had led its final assault against the world, with the forces of Azeroth having to unite to push the demons back and put an end to the Legion for good. The heroes successfully destroyed the demon war machine and imprisoned the demon's leader, the fallen titan Sargeras, but not before Sargeras impaled Azeroth with his giant sword, leaving a corrupted wound behind. The sword had pierced the land of Silithus, located in southern Kalimdor, and it was there that a new, powerful resource was discovered, Azerite. Azerite is the crystallized blood of the dormant titan that sleeps inside Azeroth. And the titan blood is incredibly powerful as it turns out. Now Alliance and Horde forces skirmish in Silithus and the surrounding areas in attempts to acquire as much Azerite as possible. After the Argus campaign had ended and the demons were defeated, Kalia Menethil, former princess of Lordaeron, met with Anduin Rin, the king of Stormwind. Anduin asked Kalia if she wanted to be the new ruler of Lordaeron, but she declined, saying that she isn't super interested in ruling anybody. There, Anduin and Kalia's friend, Alonzus Fowl, planned on setting up a meeting between some humans of Stormwind and their forsaken relatives who live in the undead Undercity. The Alliance sent the proposal of a one-day ceasefire and meet-up to Warchief of the Horde and Queen of the Forsaken, Sylvanas Windrunner. Sylvanas agreed to the meeting and rounded up a posse to head for neutral territory in the Arathi Highlands. Anduin and Alonzus decided that they'd take a military unit up as well, with the goal of protecting the human citizens looking to reunite with their undead family. And with that retinue, Kalia Menethil snuck her way into the group, hiding as a priest follower of Alonzus. The Horn Alliance had been skirmishing a lot lately, due to the discovery of Azerite, and because it was believed that Sylvanas had betrayed the late King of Stormwind, Varian Rin, during the initial Broken Shore assault. Because of that, the Banshee Queen kept a small army of undead nearby the gathering location, just in case, and Anduin Rin kept his small army close by in the ruined kingdoms of Stromgard. The leaders did meet up very briefly just to try and ensure peace, if only for a few hours. Unfortunately though, the undead and humans seemed to be getting along. This is when things started to take a turn for the worse because some of the undead found love and acceptance from their human relatives, and so they began to head back to Stromgard, with the intention of leaving the Horde to rejoin their families in the Alliance. Kalia saw this as a positive, and she decided to reveal herself to those present and try to convince the remaining Forsaken to join the Alliance and reunite with their old families once again. As soon as Sylvanas caught wind of this, she sent her forces to slaughter everybody at the gathering, humans and undead alike. And the Banshee Queen personally showed up to kill the former princess herself. Anduin and his warriors were able to save a few that they could and retrieve Kalia's body. After the slaughter at the gathering, Anduin and Alonzus brought Kalia's body to Netherlight Temple. There, the king, the priest, and the Naru of the Netherlight Temple resurrected Kalia as an undead imbued with the power of the light. The undead Kalia then decided to answer the call as the one true leader of Lordaeron, as she wanted to guide the Forsaken on a better path than where Sylvanas was leading them. However, the princess didn't know how to lead just yet, so she began learning from her friend Alonzus Fowl on how to do so. The Horden Alliance decided to prepare their forces for an inevitable upcoming battle by rallying allied factions into their folds, like the Suramar Nightborn and the Dark Iron Dwarves. And while all that is happening, the planet of Azeroth itself was calling out for aid. Magni Bronzebeard, the speaker for the planet Azeroth, had reached out to the champions of the Horden Alliance to ask them for aid in the plight of the planet. 
it seems that Azeroth was being wounded beyond just the Sword of Sargeras. Chaotic and destructive storms have been rampaging across the continents, and much worse things are occurring. Magni decides to give the champions artifacts called the Hearts of Azeroth, which can be powered by Azerite, and tasks the heroes with aiding the healing of the world and saving their planet. Okay, so to really understand the core plot of the battle for Azeroth, the why there is a battle for Azeroth, I am going to have to explain some stuff that was covered in the novella A Good War. Basically, Sylvanas is done believing in or trusting in people. Now she has a singular motivation, which is basically, she wants to live forever. And other people don't have it in them to truly support her goal, and therefore they are either enemies or puppets or both. So Sylvanas' big plan is to defeat all of her enemies one at a time, and her greatest threat are the humans of Stormwind and their alliance. Alrighty, so Sylvanas calls up Varrock Sourfang, and she walks him through a pretty solid case. She tells the Orc Overlord, the Alliance will never forgive the Horde. We will always forgive each other, then go right back to killing each other, only a few months later. It is inevitable. Sourfang states that Stormwind is impossible to conquer, it's just too well defended, and Sylvanas agrees, but she points out that there is another way to take down Stormwind. Currently, after the events of World of Warcraft Legion, the Alliance and Horde navies are completely wiped out. There is very little able to happen in terms of naval transportation and supplying. The Banshee Queen proposes that the Horde assault and conquer the Night Elf lands in Kalimdor and take over Teldrassil, holding it captive. Because the Alliance mostly reside in the Eastern Kingdoms, they don't have the ships or the supplies required to aid the Night Elves in a timely manner, so taking over Darnassus and the Kaldorai lands should be feasible. The next step is that the Alliance would naturally want to retaliate and take over the Horde powerhouse city located on their continent, the Undercity. However, there would be a political divide in the Alliance, naturally between those who want to retake the Night Elf lands of Kalimdor and those who want to attack the undead lands of the Eastern Kingdoms. This political discourse would be too hard for the newly crowned king, Anduin Rin, to properly navigate and the Alliance would eventually dissolve due to infighting, resulting in a fractured faction with nations only interested in protecting themselves against a fully unified horde. And finally, the Horde would then take over Alliance capitals one by one until all that remained was Stormwind, and then they would burn it down properly this time, and ensure a peaceful existence for the Horde forever. Sourfang agrees that the Alliance will eventually attack the Horde again, and unlike Stormwind, Orgrimmar has proven to be vulnerable to sieges. And he agrees that taking over Darnassus shouldn't be the hardest thing in the world, so the Overlord gives a thumbs up to the Warchief's plans. The plan kicks off with the goblins in Silithus starting to spread rumors that the Alliance spies then pick up. Rumors that a massive horde army is marching down to Silithus in order to assure that all the Azerite there is owned by horde hands. Word of this army reaches Toronto Whisperwind, leader of the Night Elves, and she decides to rally her armies and whatever small amount of ships they have left to set off to Silithus in order to protect the Alliance station there and to stop the Horde from getting a monopoly on so much of a valuable resource. As the Night Elf forces rush down to Silithus, this mighty Horde army slowly marches out of Orgrimmar and into the Barrens, only to turn north instead of south, marching right into Ashenvale Forest. The Night Elf guards that remained behind in Ashenvale Forest were ambushed by the Horde, and those that escaped warned Malfurion Stormrage, leader of the Night Elf Druids, of the invading Orc army. Captain Deloran Summermoon rallied as large of a defense force as she could and attempted to hold the Horde from marching any further through Ashenvale. Unfortunately, the remaining Night Elf guards were forced to retreat to Darkshore where Malfurion and a few druids met up with them, and at this point, an evacuation order had been issued, and all of those residing in Darnassus and Darkshore had to escape via boat or hippogriff to Stormwind. 
Malfurion and Delorin were able to stall the Horde forces long enough for the Silithus army to return. With this new hiccup, Sylvanas decided to split up her army, having Sour Fang lead one force through Fellwood while she stayed behind to keep pressure on Darkshore. Sylvanas pushed forward and Sour Fang went around the Night Elf army in a classic pincer attack, resulting in the injury of Malfurion Stormrage and the continued pressure of the Horde forces. Eventually, Tyrande, Whisperwind, Malfurion Stormrage, and many other Night Elves were forced to retreat, with Captain Deloran's Summer Moon staying behind. Realizing the inevitable outcome, she decided to stand fast with a few other rangers and buy as much time as possible before the beaches of Darkshore were fully under Horde control. Unfortunately for her, the Night Elf forces that did not escape the Battle of Darkshore were slain, but those that did escape could only look back as the Horde began marching towards their home, undefended. Innocence remain in the tree. This is war. No. This is hatred. Rage. Ah, <laughs> oh, don't grieve. You'll soon join your loved ones. I grieve for you. You've made life your enemy, and that is a war you'll never win. You can kill us, but you cannot kill hope. Can't I? Because the Horde torched Tedrasil, they no longer had a captive city as a bargaining chip. Remember, the original plan was to throw the Alliance into disarray, full of inner conflict erupting between those who want to rescue Tedrasil versus those who want to react and capture the Undercity. But now, with there being no Tedrasil to rescue, only one course of action remained. A course the Alliance unanimously agreed upon. As the Alliance forces began to muster against the Forsaken Land, Sylvanas immediately evacuated the Undercity and planned for the arrival of her enemy's army. The Alliance pushed deep into Tyrus Fall Glades and eventually laid siege to the Undercity. As the battle raged on, the Horde Defense forces were pushed back into the ruins of Lordaeron, and that's when Sylvanas unleashed the Blight onto the Alliance. The Horde fell back deeper into the Undercity as Jaina Proudmoore showed up to clear a way through the Blight and into the ruins itself. The Horde forces bought as much time as they could against the Alliance, but they were eventually pushed back into the Throne Room. It was in the Throne Room where Sourfang argued with Sylvanas about the concept of honor, insisting that she didn't have any. Sourfang decided to leave the Horde leaders cowering in the Throne Room so he could die an honorable death at the hands of the Alliance. While the Orc does that, the rest of the Horde leaders actually escape via airship, leaving just the Banshee Queen alone. Sourfang was beaten by the Alliance and then taken prisoner by Anduin Rin. Afterwards, the Alliance leaders stormed into the throne room and demanded Sylvanas surrender. She responded by blowing up the entirety of the Undercity with Blight and fleeing with the rest of the Horde back to Orgrimmar. The plan was to get all of the Alliance leaders into one small area and then destroy them with the Blight, however, thanks to Jaina Proudmoore, the Alliance leadership was able to teleport out at the last second. 
The early part of the conflict ended with the Horde holding dominant positions in Kalimdor and the Alliance holding dominant positions in the Eastern Kingdoms. But we're just getting started. While the two factions of Azeroth were reinforcing their defenses across the planet, Talanji, princess of the Zandalari Trolls, set sail to find help for the ever-increasing problems happening in her land. However, she was captured, along with the Prophet Zul, by the Alliance, and they were being held inside Stormwind's stockades. Hearing this, Horde agents snuck into Stormwind to free the captured Zandalari Trolls. They even attempted to free Sourfang, who was there. But the orc refused to leave and rejoin a horde under Sylvanas' control. Leaving Sourfang behind, Talanji and her rescuers managed to steal a ship and were consequently chased by the Alliance all the way into Zandalari waters, where her people's navy promptly arrived and shot down her pursuers. Upon reaching Zandalar, the horde formed an official alliance with the Zandalari, agreeing to help them with their domestic problems in exchange for their naval and military might. From there, the horde had set up camp inside the capital city of Dazar Lor. Horde heroes then ventured out into the lands of Zandalar to help handle their nearby threats. Nazmir is where the Blood Troll tribes resided, and they've been stirring up some serious trouble. The Blood Trolls have been slaying Zandalari Loa, building up a massive army and powering up the god of blood, Gahoon. Talanji and the Horde go to aid whatever remaining Loa they can and also attempt to strike up a bargain with the Loa of Death, Bwansamdi. Bwansamdi and the other Loas team up with Talanji and the Horde to put a stop to the Blood Trolls by assaulting the Blood Troll capital. With the leader of the Blood Trolls and her Titan construct falling into the ruins of the ancient Titan research facility, Oldir. Now we'll get back to Old Deer in a bit, but first we gotta head back to Dazar Lore where Zul and several other members of the Zanjuli Council have started a coup against King Rastakhan. See, Rastakhan had been king of the Zandalari Trolls for over 200 years, and Zul and the council had grown tired of the Undying Troll. Now Zul worships Gahoon, an old god imprisoned in Old Deer and he has been rallying the Blood Trolls, along with some other forces, to storm the kingdom, kill Rastakhan, and bring upon a new era of blood. In the coup, Rastakhan is mortally wounded by Zul, but he managed to escape with the help of the Horde. While on the brink of death, Blansamdi arrived to take Rastakhan's spirit, which had dodged him for centuries. But that's when the great Loa of Kings, Razan, shows up and he stops the Loa of Death and helps restore the Troll King back to full health. Then, Rastakhan, the Horde, and the mightiest of Loas chase Zul all the way to Atal Dazar, the burial site of Kings. However, this turned out to be a trap as Zul was waiting for them, and he was able to kill Razan and resurrect the Loa of Kings as a servant. The Horde was able to kill their zombified Razan, but Zul escaped back to Dazar lore. And without the power of Razan, Rastakhan began to age and weaken rapidly. The Troll King reached out to Bwansamdi and made a deal with him. He promised that if Bwansamdi would grant him the power to take back his kingdom and kill Zul, then the Loa of Death would be considered the greatest of all the Loa, and he would be moved up to the peak of the Zandalari pantheon. Bwansamdi agreed, but on one condition that Rastakhan's bloodline would be forever bound to the Loa of Death. And with that, the king agreed. Zul was able to unleash an ancient old god warbringer Mithrax and bring it and an army of blood trolls into Zandalar. Rastakhan, his loyalists, the Loa, and the Horde all fought back against Zul and the blood trolls. Rastakhan and his forces were able to reclaim the city, but during his duel with Zul, Mithrax was able to destroy a grand seal inside Dazar Lore, unlocking the entrance to Old Deer, the prison of Gahoon. The prophet Zul was eventually slain by Rastakhan, and even though the blood trolls were routed from the city, Mithrax was able to open the gates of Old Deer and unleash the corrupting rot of the blood god Gahoon. The Horde then teamed up with the Zandalari to go into Old Deer and kill the old god stopping the rise of the Blood God's corruption and recovering the Titan Watcher Mother, who Magni Bronzebeard took with him to help with the restoration of Azeroth. Years ago, shortly after the events of the Third War and the Frozen Throne, 
Admiral Dalen Broadmoor, Lord of Kul Tiras, arrived on the shores of Duratar in search of the human refugees that had fled the Scourge and the Burning Legion. Instead of finding humans, he ran into orcs, and even though Warchief of the Horde Thrall had a peace treaty with Jaina Proudmoore and her people of Theramor, that didn't stop Dalen from waging a war against the Horde. When Jaina had found out her father had been fighting her recent allies, she tried to reason with him, which resulted in her removal of leadership of Theramor, and it spurred on even more hatred between the two factions. Jaina then aided Thrall and his heroes in disposing of her father, as it was the only way to ensure peace. By the end of the conflict between the Kul'tiran forces and the Horde, Admiral Dalen Proudmoore lay dead. Thrall didn't blame Jaina for the actions of her father, and so their peace treaty remained standing. And even those in the Alliance kingdoms held little sympathy for the death of Dalen Proudmoore, since he chose war after repeated attempts of peace from all sides. When the Kingdom of Kotiris had learned what happened, however, of Jaina allying with the Horde in a fight which led to her father's death, they considered her a traitor and a murderer. Now, so many years and wars later, Jaina Proudmoore returned to Kotiris to ask for their aid. After Princess Talanji and Zul escaped the stockades, Jaina had feared that with the Horde and Zandalari trolls uniting, that the Alliance would have no naval power left on Azeroth. So she decided to attempt to recruit her people, the seafaring folk of Kul Tiris, and their navy. Jaina arrived at the Kul Tiris capital, Boralis, and was greeted by a crowd of people calling her a traitor and a murderer. There she met with her mom, Catherine Proudmoore, the current Lord Admiral, who decided to sentence Jaina to be imprisoned for her crimes. But Jaina wasn't the only Proudmoore trapped in Kul Tiris, nor the only one in danger. Her younger brother Tandred was considered lost at sea at the moment, along with a majority of the Kul Tiran fleet. In actuality, Tandred and his armada had been trapped in an artificial storm for months, held captive by the Tide Sages of Kul Tiris, who now served the Queen of the Deep, Ajara. And it wasn't just the Proudmoore children that were in danger either, Catherine was in the mists of facing a coup. See, Lady Priscilla Ashvane was an old friend of Catherine Proudmoore at one point in time, but she was also head of one of the leading houses of Kul Tiris, and she had been plotting to remove Catherine as Lord Admiral and take control of the country for herself. She even teamed up with raiders and pirates to do so. It was Squire Talia Fordragon that uncovered Ashmane's conspiracy and told the Lord Admiral about it. When they confronted Lady Ashmane, she even admitted it and then fled Boralus so she could remuster her forces and come back to take over the weakened capital. At this point, Catherine was convinced to free Jaina from her imprisonment, a task easier said than done since Jaina was being held captive on the Isle of Fate's End, where she was then captured and tormented in a realm of nightmares. Catherine had entered the realm and learned of all of the fears and regrets of her daughter, along with the truth of how Dalen Proudmoore died and how no one could have stopped him. So Catherine freed, forgave, and apologized to her daughter for everything, and the two Proudmoors returned to Boralus to rally up a defense force against Ashvane. While Jaina and Catherine were fending off Ashvane's forces in the city, Talia had led some alliance forces against the Tide Sages, and they were able to stop the magical storm trapping the Kul'tiran fleet. By then, Ashvane had been pushed out of the city, but she still had her Iron Tide raiders and their pirate ships in the waters. As the pirates began to close in around the city, Jaina was then able to summon the newly freed fleet and guide them back to Kul Tiris, just in time to surround Ashvane's ships and save the capital. With the three Proudmoors now united, Catherine agreed to have Kul Tiris rejoin the Alliance, and she also handed off her title to her daughter. Jaina Proudmoore, now Lord Admiral of Kul Tiris, was able to use the Kul Tiran fleet in the war against the Horde in the latest battle for Azeroth. The Horde and Alliance had been waging war against each other on both fronts. The Alliance had been sending in spies and recon forces into Xandalar, and the Horde had been poking and prodding in Kul Tiris. 
While on a mission to find some corpses of fallen Kotiran captains who died at sea during Warcraft 2, the Horde instead found the body of Derek Proudmoore, Jaina's older brother. The Horde had then used the body of the dead Kotiran prince to taunt the Alliance and retreat with their new corpse. The Alliance, however, were being a lot more productive. They had set up preparations for an Alliance invasion into Zandalar, into the capital of Dazar and Lore. The Alliance had rallied up two forces. One army went in and invaded from Nazmir, under the cover of a powerful fog. There, they were to be a distraction, to lead the Zandalari defenses out of Dazar and Lore. The second force was the Kotiran naval fleet, spearheaded by Jaina Proudmoor. The Kotiran forces breached through the port defenses of the city, blitzed through the city guard, and prepared to kill King Rastakhan before the Horde forces could return. However, the Horde were able to see through the Bait of Nazmir, albeit too late to stop the Kotiran invasion, but sooner than the Alliance were planning on. The Horde forces, led by Princess Talanji, raced back to the troll capital. There, the Horde and Alliance fought through the streets of Dazar and Lore. Seeing his people spent, King Rastakhan called upon the aid of Blansamdi and used his necromantic powers to summon undead warriors to aid in the defense of Zandalar. But it was too little, too late. The Alliance had reached the throne room and faced Rastakhan. And Talanji arrived just in time to hear the last words of her father. Having ravaged the city, killed the king, and dealt an irreversible blow to the Horde, the Alliance forces began to retreat. But the Zandalari were hot on their heels. The Troll and Horde forces pursued the retreating Kotirans by boat. However, Jaina Proudmoor stayed behind, freezing the surrounding waters and preventing the Horde ships from advancing. Bad news for Jaina though, the Horde and Trolls proved too much for the Lord Admiral, and she was too badly injured to keep going, and had to be forced to teleport herself to Boralus to receive immediate medical attention. After the battle, both factions had to nurse their wounds, and Talanji, now Queen of Zandalar, had to address her people and come to terms with her new status and responsibilities, as well as the death of her father. But with so much of Talanji's navy and military forces destroyed in battle, she feared that the Horde would abandon Zandalar to its doom. Warchief Sylvanas, though, assured her that the Horde would stay by her side to the bitter end. In fact, there was already a retaliation plan being set into motion. In the stockades of Stormwind, King Anduin Rin met with his prisoner Varrock Sourfang. In the conversation, Sourfang said he no longer supported Sylvanas and what she was doing to the Horde. And after that conversation, Anduin just let the orc warrior escape. The old orc made his way to the Swamp of Sorrows to recuperate. After hearing news of Sourfang's escape, however, the Dark Lady sent Dark Rangers after the orc with orders to assassinate him. Sourfang fought off the Dark Rangers with the help of Zakan, a young troll who served under his command during the battle for Lordaeron, who had sought him out. Zakan then left Varrock to bide his time, returning to Orgrimmar to spread the news of Sourfang's death to Sylvanas and her loyalists, and to stir up the whispers of a rebellion and the rest of the Horde. Now, with Lordaeron blighted up, the Alliance forces still in the northern part of the Eastern Kingdom began to move south fighting through the Horde-contested lands of Silver Pine Forest, Hillsbrad Foothills, and the Alteric Mountains. Eventually, they met up with the forces of Stromgard in the Arathi Highlands, where they began a war front in the land of Arathi. The Horde had sent several champions and blood elves down to the Horde outpost of Argarok, the last line of Horde defense in the Eastern Kingdoms. And while that was happening, the Warchief of the Horde had successfully resurrected the body of the fallen Kotiran Prince, Derek Proudmoore, turning him into a Forsaken. The plan was to brainwash him into being a loyal servant of Sylvanas, and then fill his body with Blight and send him back to the Kotiris to act as a bomb and destroy the kingdom. Bane Bloodhoof, however, chieftain of the Bloodhoof Tarin, was repulsed by that plan and he had quietly smuggled Derek Proudmoore away from Sylvanas and into open waters before anyone had noticed. Bane had then contacted Jaina Proudmoore and called for a meeting of peace, if it was only just for one moment. It was there where Bane returned Derek back to his sister, 
who then took her brother somewhere safe. The Forsaken Prince would never be accepted back in Cold Tiras, but he at least could be safe from Sylvanas and her plots. And while Derek was currently too far away to receive the War Chief's wrath, Bane was not. The Tarn Chieftain was branded a traitor and taken away into the pits below Orgrimmar. The dagger Zalateth, recently used in the battle against the Burning Legion, had reached out to the heroes of Azeroth. When found, it revealed that the Naga Queen Azara was responsible for the horrible storms happening in the oceans around the world, and she was planning to use three powerful artifacts to unleash a storm so devastating that it would destroy all the land of Azeroth. The heroes, along with Zalateth, were able to collect the artifacts before the Naga were, and in the process also got the dagger of mortal form. But it turns out that the old god dagger had tricked the Azerothian heroes, and she had made a deal with Nazoth, the last remaining old god on the planet, exchanging the artifacts for her connection to the dagger to be severed. Afterwards, the champions were compelled to take the dagger that formerly held Zalateth to Sylvanas Windrunner, who instructed her most loyal servant, Nathanos Blightcaller, to follow the will of the dagger into the open seas. Afterwards, Horde forces sailed out with Alliance ships eventually right behind them, right to where the Will of the Dagger led, an ocean trap which dragged both forces down to the newly awakened depths of Najatar, the kingdom of Queen Ajara and of the Naga. Nathanos disappeared, leaving Lorthamar Thoran and Thalysra to lead the Horde forces, while Jaina Proudmoore and Chandra's Feathermoon led the Alliance army. As the two factions squabbled over resources in order to fortify their own bases and carry out their own plans in Najatar, both Lorthamar and Jaina received word that Bane Bloodhoof was to be executed. Jaina then quickly teleported them out of Najatar and to the outskirts of Orgrimmar. There, they had planned to rescue the Tauren on their own, but they were greeted by Varrock Sourfang, along with his new recruit, Thrall, the former Warchief of the Horde. These legends of Azeroth snuck their way into the cells of Orgrimmar, confronted a few of those who were still loyal to Sylvanas, and then eventually freed Bane Bloodhoof. Jaina then teleported the rescue team out of the dungeons and sent them all to Thunderbluff. The Horde would need to rally themselves for the Wrath of Sylvanas, and prepare for a fight. Afterwards, Jaina and Lorthamar then returned to Najatar, uniting their armies to fight against the Naga Queen. The forces of Azeroth pushed through Najatar and entered the Eternal Palace. There they faced off against Ashara's toughest minions, then finally reached the Naga Queen herself. Champions of the Horde Alliance had been powering up their hearts of Azeroth over the battles of the Fourth War, and now, with fully charged artifacts, they had been tricked into the deepest parts of Ashara's palace, the Last Prison. The Last Prison was an ancient titan contraption that was used to seal away the old god Nazoth. And it's in the last prison where the heroes of the Alliance and the Horde were fighting Azara. And it's here that Azara decides to spring her trap, siphoning the power of the hearts of Azeroth in order to break the seal and free the old god. Even though Queen Azara was ultimately defeated, she did successfully unleash Nazoth, who swooped her away before the champions of Azeroth could finish the Naga off for good. With the Naga defeated and Nazoth free, the Horan Alliance had a lot of work to do, but before they could deal with the Old God, they needed to deal with the Banshee Queen. Varrock Sourfang and Anduin Rin teamed up, uniting the Alliance forces alongside Horde revolutionaries, ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Sylvanas and her mostly forsaken loyalists. After taking over most of Doratar, the united front of Azeroth challenged Sylvanas, Sourfang, wielding Anduin's sword, declared Makora against the Warchief, a duel to the death. Sylvanas accepted. The Banshee Queen won the duel easily, but the fight she lost was the one of words. Sylvanas had been tricked into outbursting that the Horde is nothing, revealing she held no loyalty to the Horde at all. After killing Sourfang, the Banshee fled Duratar, and the body of the old orc warrior was brought inside Orgrimmar, his death reuniting the Horde into something more than just Sylvanas' soldiers. 
With the fight on the home front taken care of, the Horde and Alliance were called upon by the Black Prince, Rathion, in order to stop Nazoth. The Old God's corruption was seeping through all of Azeroth, anchoring the reality of the Black Empire, Nyalotha, to that of the living world. Rathion, being a black dragon, was more susceptible to Nazoth's corruption than most, and so he was desperate to put an end to the God of Madness before he lost his sanity completely. Magni Brownsbeard worked on using the Forge of Origination and the powers of Azeroth to destroy Nazoth for good, but before he could do that, the Old God would need to be weakened, and so Rathion led the heroes of Azeroth into Nyalotha itself to fend off against the most powerful soldiers the Black Empire had. While inside the Waking City, the Black Prince rescued Ajara, who was being tortured for betraying her master. It turns out that the Naga Queen had intended on using Zalatath, that was secretly given to her by Nathanos Blightcaller, to kill the Old God. But she was captured before she got a chance to use the weapon. After being freed, Azara gives the dagger to Rathion, instructing the dragon to use it on Nazoth. Rathion fought against the fury of the old god along with his champions, and in the final moments the heroes were able to use their hearts of Azeroth to guide the power of the Forge of Origination to laser beam Nazoth to death, destroying the old god and Nyalotha along with it. And so Azeroth was saved from its last old god and her heroes were able to return back to their lands to settle out their upcoming peace. The Horde Alliance had agreed to an armistice, a ceasefire, and while they still bickered and detained a few of each other, the Fourth War of Azeroth was, for all intents and purposes, over. Though several high-profile Horde members were lost, they either died fighting in the war, or they were loyalists of Sylvanas who fled, so the Horde leadership needed to be replaced. The Horde would no longer follow a singular warchief, though. Instead, they would be guided by a council, with Thrall returning as leader of the Orcs, Rokan leader of the Trolls, Gazlo of the Goblins, and Lillian Voss temporarily being in charge of the Forsaken. Though the Forsaken itself was trying to figure out what to do with their own permanent leadership positions, many currently being guided and led by Kalia Menethel, who was embracing her on death and her burden of leadership. She was also currently helping Derek Proudmore readjust to the land of the living and becoming a well received figure to those left behind by Sylvanas. The Alliance, on the other hand, were mainly focused on tracking down and killing Sylvanas. Tyrande Whisperwind had refused to make peace with the Horde, and instead was fully bent on revenge. During the Fourth War, Tyrande had performed an ancient Kaldurai ritual to turn herself into the Wrath of Elune, the Night Warrior. The Night Warrior had slain many Horde warriors during the Fourth War, but her only real desire was the death of the Banshee Queen. Uh, the Banshee Queen, though, was currently far away from the vengeance of the Night Warrior, as she had arrived in the frozen north, at Icecrown Citadel. There, she fought her way through the Lich King's guards, and at the top of Icecrown, Sylvanas fought the Lich King Bolvar Fordragon, ultimately defeating him. She took his helmet as a prize, but instead of wearing the crown and claiming dominion over the Scourge, she broke it in two opening up a massive rift between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. And that about does it. As the expansions keep going, the stories keep getting more and more busy. Just full of characters and plots, and some of the plots and characters kind of get picked up and dropped off willy-nilly between expansions. I know I didn't mention the Island of Robot Gnomes, but honestly, it doesn't add anything. It's just an island of robot gnomes. Overall though, this is the conclusion of the fourth war of Azeroth. It is all the lore you need to know. And it is the ending of a lot of stories in the Warcraft universe. I figured I'd wrap this series up with the battle for Azeroth. Just finish it. That is me saying that there will not be a Shadowlands lore video. If you want to make one on your own, you're more than welcome to steal the Hearthstone cards idea. I don't own it. <laughs> I don't care. I do want to thank you all for taking this journey through WoW's lore with me. I actually didn't play most of these expansions after Wrath, 
So a lot of this stuff was new to me. I will hopefully release more Warcraft related videos every now and again, but as far as lore goes, this is where the Warcraft story ends. Thank you all so much for watching. Have a good one and take it easy.